Okay, welcome everyone to Miracle Monday. And today we have a very, um, let's, I'm going to call it a little bit of an odd guest. Ha ha, just joking. Whose <laughs> <laughs> so topic is not remembering to laugh. Leon was born halfway up Mount Kilimanjaro during the latter <laughs> stages of the Ming period. <laughs> As a child, Leon was trained in the outskirts of Shanghai to become a tightrope walker in Cirque du Soleil by an aging nun called Shirley Thespelis. At the age of 21, A Course in Miracles showed up in Leon's life, and for the past 31 years, he's made it his priority to never leave. Instead, he uses his copy of the book to wedge open the front door of his home in England, while he carries in the daily newspapers that he religiously studies from cover to cover. Removing the blocks to love's eternal presence and living as to demonstrate that he is not an ego is of no concern to Leon. Instead, he follows the markets intently, collects, va collects vast amounts of possessions, and worships money <laughs> above all else. He has no interest in accepting his part in the atonement and is not taken in by the central thought that the Course seeks to teach. Instead, Leon believes there is, no, there is a world and that ideas do indeed leave their source. He also believes the cause for guilt is in the world and he always gets upset for the reason he thinks. <laughs> Leon's hobbies include holding grievances, ignoring the Holy Spirit, perceiving himself as separate, avoiding inner peace, and spreading inf misinformation about what his hobbies are. And so again, we welcome Leanne and we have no idea what he's gonna talk about. <laughs> All right, Leanne, well, just feel free, you know, very, very casual. Um, you do your thing, for, you talk for as long as you want or as short as you want, and we'll just, you know, put your wings on and fly. Beautiful. Well, amazing. Some of that sounds a little bit hard to believe, doesn't it? That stuff from the bio, but. It's all true. Yeah, I do enjoy holding grievances and ignoring the Holy Spirit. And um, yeah, I love the tiny mad idea. I'm not interested in what I call the huge sane idea, which is to remember to laugh. And yeah, I guess, you know, my journey with the course has been um, quite beautiful, really. Uh, very solitary to begin with. So for the first 27 years, I literally bumped into like three or four people who had a copy of The Course in Miracles. Um, and then in 2020, during lockdown, I had that thought that's obviously very commonplace with most people these days, which is to look on the internet and see what's out there. And, you know, I didn't know anything about Ken Wapnick. I didn't know about Judy. I didn't know about the, the, the main teachers like, say, David Hofmeister or Carol Howe or the whole community. Um, so it had just been me and The Course in Miracles. And I like to tell people that I'd drawn a little red face on the cover of my book and called it Wilson. And we were just cast away together on a little desert island. Um, it came into my life when I was 21. So it was quite, you know, was during, during those very formative years, uh, I'd always had like a sense of a connection with um, my higher self. And about 14 years old, I decided to ask myself, like, what is it that you're listening to? You know, what's what is this sense of communion with this presence in your mind? And that began an external search through books and through um, conversation, through music and lyrics and films and, and just trying to find reinforcements and threads that could reflect where my thinking was going to um, and some of those things they always came up you know if I was looking to different religions whenever it came up against that kind of typical phrase of you know around the sort of saying look this is the only way you, you're not getting into heaven unless you're part of our little gang everyone else has got it wrong we've got it right and and I just instantly just shut down and just think oh, no, I'm going to look elsewhere so I kept looking through different religious studies. My mum had a, an Ernest Holmes book called This Thing Called You. 
and he's got an incredible handle on Jesus. And, and it was just that I, I really purchased that for myself a few years ago. And it's still just as powerful in my own vocabulary and sort of symbolic language. Um, and then I moved out of my family home at 21, just down the road to my own place. And my next door neighbor had a copy of A Course in Miracles. And I opened it up and I looked at that first bit where it sort of says, you know, what's all encompassing can have no opposite. And I realized that that was the articulation of what I'd been looking for. I've been looking for an all inclusive um, model whereby no one was shut out. No one was not part of what was being spoken about. Everybody had an equal place in that jigsaw of completion and and yeah the, a sense of my shoulders dropping and like right this is what I've been looking for this is the thing for me I do realize now as well there have been a couple of events prior to that where I was being prepared with um, experiences which were opening my mind up ready to receive that connection although I didn't know it at the time I didn't know it as a 21 year old I look back at it now and think I probably did well to sort of dress myself and get out the door at 21 years old, let alone, you know, really grasp all of the multi-layered interpretations of the Course in Miracles. But it spoke to me enough for me to latch in onto it and to realize that this was what I needed. Um, and then, yeah, the next 27 years, I didn't really find anybody who'd sort of who had a copy there's literally three or four people one of them being my friend who um let me borrow his and i think as well you know i did tried the workbook in like 1994 and again looking back on myself and and thinking what version of me was i back then as like a 21 year old kid it was i got x amount away into the workbook and then when it sort of says you know if you're doing these lessons right you should start to see like a glow of light around things. And I remember thinking, well, that's not happening for me. I mustn't be doing it right. And I just stopped with, you know, I didn't have the incentive and the impetus to carry on with the workbook. So I just used to read through the lessons, read through the text, read through the manual, absorb the information, learn how to put it into practice. There'd been a whole bunch of childhood trauma since about the age of two, three years old, some really massive events that had defined me for a long time as a child and reinforced the belief that there was fear waiting all the time to strike. Um, and the theme of the language of my own ego was very much about um, rejection, shame and concealment. And that kept presenting itself in all these different ways. And there was a sense um, of being able to be like a counsel, a form of a counsellor to my friends and family, and then not being able to um, kind of rectify and to, to understand why I still had an inner monologue that wasn't in keeping with the advice that I could give to people. And then the Course in Miracles gave me this model whereby I could see this triangulation between the Holy Spirit the ego and the decision maker and to realize that my awareness was listening to these two factors of um, mental activity and to realize that the ego was not me and that was an incredibly liberating experience it was like exactly what I needed to free me from something that I just couldn't work out on my own without the without the book and then that helped me to go through all the different stages of healing that I needed to go through to sort of withdraw my investment in lifelong patterns of fear and, and very much prove to me that the implication of this material brought me a greater sense of peace, you know. And then um, around the age of um, around the age of 14, I'd also discovered music. So what I did with music was what was similar to what I did with play as a child, which was to process events that were going on in my life within that world of imagination. And with the music, 
obviously was a way for me to start to talk to myself about my spiritual understanding with the course and got to the point where all I could write about was love and all I could write about was the stuff that I was learning through the course and I was obsessed with what we call concept albums like the the Who, Tommy, Quadrophenia and then the Pink Floyd albums so I set about from the age of about 18 wanting to write an album which told the story that facilitated my understanding and, and was a of something you know a subject that I could really think yeah okay this is really means a lot to me and I kept doing that with different stories um, and sometimes I'd complete it sometimes I'd um, sort of change styles of music and want to start a new story again and then I realized that basically I was I hadn't lived the ending of like whatever story it was that I was trying to write I hadn't got to the end in my life to be able to conclude it um, so then I wrote a record called Back Above the Clouds, which was with my group Warm Rain. And this was a record that I wrote, you know, surreptitiously imbuing my course understanding is how I like to describe it. So, you know, any of us guys would go, oh, OK, and you just see the Course in Miracles um, language within what I was talking about. But I also was still trying to present it in a way for the world of form so that the people who weren't spiritual, which are very, very numerous in that um, sort of world of music, you know, they could still relate to what was going on without it being outside of their understanding. But then for me to also know that because I'd put this message in the music, I was still helping to speak to their mind. And, that was me processing what had happened to me in my life. So the story is about someone whose hero dies and they, it leaves a big void in their life. And then because there's a void in their life, they start to lose perspective on what they should focus on. And then they start to question their own mortality. And what this does is it becomes a catalyst for them to turn their attention inward and this man realizes that when he was a child, he has a recollection of that when he was a child, he used to pretend that he could fly with his arms outstretched, just running around. And the reason I chose that symbol was to, to give like an impression of unlimited imagination. So when kids pretend that they can fly, they don't tend to think, you know, oh, I'm 10 or 15 feet off the ground. I better not imagine I can fly too high just in case, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's unlimited. You're up above the clouds. You're just experiencing unlimited imagination. And he has this recollection of this old connection with the deeper self. And, and again, the reason I used, used the child was very much like, say, Wordsworth saying, the child is the father of the man um, in this vernacular for the people who weren't particularly spiritual. I could also say that the child was closer to a source energy, like less distorted by events and occurrences in the world. So therefore was still holding a, a more pure frequency from creation. And people could accept that without thinking, oh, this is too cosmic or this is too spiritual, you know, and, and shut down their, capacity to listen and take in what I was presenting them with and then this man who remembers that um, the connection with himself as a young boy he starts to see this connection as in dual aspects so he's viewing the child from the perspective of the man and then as his memories become uncovered he realizes that he is the child still and the child is the man and there's that convergence of these two aspects into the one being and obviously very much representing our recollections of our higher self, our connection with the Holy Spirit. Once we do break free of the shackles of all of the thinking of the ego and although as a man, he realizes that he can't necessarily run around the garden with his arms outstretched pretending to fly because he's probably going to get carted off to the loony bin. What he does do is he uses his imagination as a man and he realizes that he starts to have flying dreams. 
So this is like an indication that this connection and this level of thinking is now starting to present itself at a subconscious level and it's seeping in beyond his conscious thought. And it helps him to reconnect with his self so that he can find his healing and his happiness and his peace. And it also helps him to find some sort of way of dealing with the loss of his hero so that he can find a way forward from that and by merging the two aspects of himself have a more happier and peaceful life and the last song on the record is called like equilibrium and it's only got a couple of lines of lyrics but it says like keep my feet on the ground let my mind rise above the clouds and it was very much like the mixture of the man being on feet on the ground and then is the childlike connection being able to just go to any unlimited space so that was still a very solitary experience spiritually for me I, I still had this message to myself to my higher self to other people that I had concealed in this music um and I'd written about love in a way, though, that that it could be interpreted based on however you came to love. You know, if you'd had, a, like I said, if you had a spiritual understanding, you'd go, oh, right, OK. And you could connect that this was with Holy Spirit or with God. Um, and if you didn't, you could think, well, this guy lost his hero. He connected with himself. That gave him a better life in the world of form. But it was still concealment for me, and it was still carrying on some of these kind of egotistical characteristics which had defined my ego through my first, I don't know, 30, 40 years or whatever. So um, I then got asked to do an online article for somebody about A Course in Miracles and I thought to myself, whoa, hold on a minute. So what, like step out and actually talk about A Course in Miracles without secretly kind of like encoding it in my lyrics. Um, and I thought, okay, yeah, I'm going to do this. This sounds really good. So it was really, really helpful. It was really practical. And it was, it was a very useful process because I had to plan it. I had to think, you know, this is going to be for people who'd heard nothing about the course and for people who might have heard about it so it was a great way of me getting to see my understanding in front of myself on sheets of paper and go okay yeah I can see what's going on here you know and, and kind of get a feel for how much I'd got to grips with what I've been studying for the last 20 odd years um and in the process of doing that, I contacted the Foundation for Inner Peace and said, look, I want to reproduce some of the material. What do I do? And I ended up making a really good friend in Laura Fenimore. And we speak all the time and she's helped me with other stuff. And then one morning I'm standing on the doorstep here. I like to start my day with coffee and looking at the clouds and seeing what the sky is up to. And very, very clearly it just goes, this is just the start to the point where I'm like, Hello, you know, it was a really strong message. And I've been thinking about doing a podcast about A Course in Miracles, but, you know, as a musician, I've always been on the other side of the microphone. I've always been the one being asked all the questions. So it was quite an unusual thought. And it was also like a, a thought to think, well, you know, you've got no experience of this. There was lots of reasons to think, no, I don't want to do this. Um, and then the guys on Miracle Voices got me on there to talk about my forgiveness story. So my forgiveness story relates to my dad. You know, he's uh, the character that really defined a lot of the egoic kind of patterns of my childhood. Bless his heart. He was um, very much consumed by the world of drugs and he was a drug addict and a drug dealer and he ended up being addicted to heroin for um, a long time and uh, an alcoholic and in and out of prison through my childhood so this loss of this hero was what I used to you know put the experience into the music that I was doing and to speak from a point of authenticity so it's very important to me that 
when you sing that you you've got an air of truth about what you're singing i think truth's got a frequency and we all pick up on that truth and interestingly like carol howard come on to my podcast and we were talking about human behavior she's a you know she's got so much wisdom she's incredible and she was explaining to me that um i think seven percent of language seven percent of communication is the words the next 23 percent is how you gesticulate and how you animate and what you talk about and then the next 70 percent is your energy so we all read energy and I wanted to be singing about stuff that was authentic to me, coming from a place of sincerity, from experience. And I wanted to present it in a way that said, look, yeah, I went through all of that. It's absolutely horrible, you know, for decades. It was terrible, you know, but look, you know, now I've come through the other side. And again, it used to be about concealment. I never used to be able to tell people what my dad was doing. I never used to be comfortable with the guilt by association because the people where we lived would realize that, oh no, you're, you're his son. And it's like, so there's so much to work through that, um, that perpetuated this concealment. And then strangely, like I said, even the Course in Miracles study was very private and solitary and almost hidden and off topic in my life. Um, so to come out and do the article and then to start doing the podcasts and to talk from a place of authenticity and to experience just being carried, you know, every time I thought of somebody to come on, I think, oh, and I'd get a sense and I'd contact them and they just go, yeah, sounds great, you know. And then obviously through getting to have these one to ones with all these beautiful people, um, then obviously I get to go away and listen to what they've said and come back to it and revisit it and come back to it. Getting to share with people, teach, as we've been talking, you know, Luigi, for example, you know, when I found him on Instagram last year, I said to my wife, you're not going to believe this guy, you know, he's like, he's swearing all the time. He's shooting from the hip. He's having no nonsense. He's just giving it out. I was like, God, it, it, I, you know, it was, it was what I, really what I needed. It was like, well, this is incredible, you know? And I was like, he, he never allowed comments on his videos at the time on YouTube. Um, so the way I found him was through Instagram. And I messaged him a couple of times and then just said, look, you know, I really like what you're doing, blah, blah, blah. Didn't get a reply because obviously he was thinking, no, I'm nobody's guru. And then I just said again, look, I've started a podcast. Would you be up for it? I realize I've got enough of a handle on you as a character to know that you're probably going to go, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> and uh, he got back to me and he was like, yeah, sounds great. And it's like, wow. So, you know, again, just carried and carried. So, you know, went through like getting up to 24 guests now um, and putting together a mosaic of all of this different understanding started it without a blueprint didn't know what I was doing it just revealed itself to me in process and it's ended up being like trying to marry that two worlds of just what we understand to be the non-dual understanding so we could sit and we could say look you know we understand the non-dual uh, understanding where say for example with like Adi Shanti would say um, you know imagine trust in silence more than any thought that you could ever have you know it might be Rumi saying there's a, a voice that uses silence listen and we know that that's beyond language these are things awareness is beyond consciousness this top wrong stuff is like it doesn't require definition the act of definition almost you know means you're off point with what you're trying to talk about really if you think about the Tao the Tao Te Ching sort of saying the God that can be spoken of isn't God so any attempt to try and define this um, this ineffable transconceptual um, awareness is is like you, you know it's a concession to use language to talk about it because you're you're making um you're making a limitation on something that's beyond limits. So there's one, one aspect of that. And there's a phrase that I really like, which says, you know, we can use the language of duality without believing in it. 
because otherwise we wouldn't be sitting here now. I'd have just sat here looking at this in silence. So we need to talk. We need to share ideas. We need to combine because everybody's got an equally valid take on things. We've all had an individual path that's led us to where we are today. And when we do join our minds with those thoughts and those thoughts increase in strength, then that transmits outward. So one thing that I've kind of focused on is like experiential application of um, this understanding. It's like not theology. It's not sitting around like, what's your favorite lesson? Let's let's recite chapter 15. You know, all the we can all do that on our own, on our own. It's like, let's talk in this conversation. Let's riff some ideas backwards and forwards and sort of say, you know, what do you do about this and how does this present itself so that we could create a toolkit for people. So that if somebody's interested in the vibe of the whole sort of series, they can just tap into it as much as they want and they can listen to the different teachers in a bit more of a conversational kind of aspect, really. You know, it's like I tend to like what I describe as like dialing in. So, you know, say with Luigi, I, I would sort of go coming back to my isolation and then coming into the course community so around about 2020 when I realized all this stuff was out there and I started you know diving into everything I'm lucky that at work I've got what I do at work in my back pocket sussed I can do it on autopilot and tend to be in my own space so then I can spend five six hours a day ingesting course material and that might be all you know let's just say for example 10 or 20 teachers during the course of a week so then when I know that I've got a guest coming on then instead of doing that sort of large spread I'll just focus on the guest and I will listen to their stuff exclusively pause write a question down I think oh that's really cool when they said that right oh I wonder what they think about this so um I've noticed as a musician being interviewed, you know, if someone said, so Leon, you're a musician, you know, um, what instrument do you play? I'd go, mm, okay, yeah, well, okay, I play a number of instruments, that, you know, but then if someone goes, Leon, I was listening to Back Above the Clouds and on track three, running out of time, you said that we, you know, we're going to merge into infinity for all eternity. <laughs> then it lights you up in a different way. It's like, you know, so I use that principle I didn't set out to use it I realized retrospectively I was like oh okay that's where that influence has come from and then the guests come on and they're like wow okay you've read my stuff or you've heard my podcasts or you know so it really brings them out of their shells and then they're like more animated so it's a bit like a light bulb you know I say to people if there's a hundred watt light bulb and the person doing the interviewing can almost have quite a large influence on um on how bright that person shines really you know it's not just the person talking i've seen it myself with the with the same guests outside of the course community you know somebody sitting there and you think they were half asleep and then you watch them again the next day and it's like they're they're like uh you know they've taken some sort of uppers or something and they're completely animated so that process has really helped me to come into the course community um, and also to sort of find a way to sort of um, just talk with people and help people. I've got a couple of counselling things going on, helping guys at the moment and sort of developing that. Um, a lot of the latest music that I've got coming through, I literally doesn't come from the instrument. It comes into my mind. So um, one track in particular, I woke up at half three in the morning, jumped up out of bed, even though I, my ego was like, no, no, stay in bed. It's nice and warm. You don't want to do that. You'll remember it in the morning. And I was like, no, I've got to go and pick up my phone and sort of sing this heart, this melody and all the words, the whole thing, like a download just came through. And it's like, so it's influencing the frequency that I'm receiving the music on as well to be interacting with guys like yourselves um, and just really enjoying spreading the joy and just remembering to laugh. You know, there's, there's something that um, I jotted down today that I'd seen, which was um, in lightness and laughter is sin gone, you know, 
it's really, really important that we laugh, that we we take joy, because you know, as we know from "Be of Good Cheer," you know, for I have overcome the world. It's like this this symbol of laughter of joy is like showing us that we're in possession of uh, a vibration of being that just is all about peace and happiness. Uh, you don't tend to laugh unless you're in a good mood. And, you know, laughter is just still a symbol. Talking to um, Cindy, Laura, Renard at the weekend and saying, you know, when we come back to like saying, we just say that God is and we simply cease to speak because we don't have lips to speak anyway. And that non-dual awareness where we've come back to the oneness we can't laugh. So, you know, you look then at the symbolism of saying a tiny mad idea in, into eternity, they cracked a tiny mad idea where the son of God forgot to laugh. It's like, <laughs> we couldn't laugh because blah, blah, blah. So it's trying to find that kind of world, you know, th that kind of bridge really between the two worlds where you can say, yes, we understand the non-dual end of things. And wow, that's the ultimate kind of goal is to focus on that but equally we're all still in the world of form we need to have a good time while we're here we need a toolkit there's no point people wandering around feeling all holier than now because they realize that they've understood x amount of the theology and not talking to other people and saying where are you at what have you got going on what are you struggling with and interestingly, you know, what you guys were saying before we pressed record, um, I asked um, Luigi to have a conversation with me at the weekend because I'd been struggling with um, with something which was pulling my attention. And I'm like, I don't want that. You know, it was like, I don't want that. So um, I gave him a call and we had a chat about about being above the battleground basically he made me a little meme posted it in his group and it's brilliant it's like he said you know when you listen to what i was talking about he said you're above the battleground you're flying like an eagle and what you're doing is you're looking down at the ground and you're seeing your shadow of the eagle passing through what's going on down on the ground and i was just like it that was the language i needed and it was he said you know just keep your chin up keep your eyes forward and then I was thinking about, you know, in the course where he says, you know, how are you getting on with the lessons? You know, have you noticed? He sort of says, you know, have you noticed that when you're lying down to do the exercises, <laughs> it's not as good as sitting up? It's the, it's the typical characteristic of how everything's presented in the course. There's no coercion. There's nothing forceful. It's very kind, but it's firm. And it tries to lead you to your own understanding. And it's almost saying, you know, when you do sit there, when you do sort of the other lessons where it says, you know, realize you're trying to do something so important here. When can God be reached directly? God's voice speaks to me all through the day, whatever that vernacular is, you know, hold yourself in a certain posture where you're sitting up with your spine <clears throat> straight and you're, you're saying physically, chin up. This is what I'm attempting to do here or not what I'm attempting to do, what I am doing here is of the utmost importance i'm connecting with the uh with the awareness of god's with love's eternal presence you know and if i just sort of slump myself down and go oh yeah what's the lesson for day god goes with me wherever i go mm -hmm. yeah. it's a different thing so in lieu to saying you know get your chin up eyes forward and i was just like wow that is so it's exactly what i needed i was ex obviously as we know him i was expecting him to say put some frankincense on, you know, surround yourself in rose crystals, sing come by our, my Lord, you know, <laughs> all that stuff he pretends he's not into, but we really know he is into. Okay. Um, and then that night I'm lying in bed, ready to drift off to sleep, just contemplating, extending gratitude. So gratitude's a massive part of my practice. I start the day with a very specific exercise which I'm teaching to these people that um, have agreed to be my subjects for the spiritual counseling. And we just do this process of, grass, of gratitude of like literally count to 10 on the out, on the out breath. You sort of say one, 
thank you to thank you or it might be in reverse like when you're breathing out you're saying thank you thank you and then we swap the numbers to the word god because as it says in the course you know god the word in itself is a complete prayer so it'll be saying thank you god thank you god and just really really just connecting with that and then take the word thank you away and just have the feeling of gratitude extend that out to include a person and then extend it out to include a moment in time and then return that sense because there's only here and now and realize that you've kept everything in that space. So that's what I do in the morning. And then I ask, how can I serve something I picked up from Wayne Dyer? You know, he just said, ask a thousand times, how can I serve? And then obviously the stuff from lesson 77 or what it whatever it is where it's like um where would you have me go what would you have me do and and really just offer yourself to be the the servant of love for the day and at the end of the day the same thing so i'm lying in my bed i've spoken to lou um he's helped me to find a context and just think you know because this is important you know it's really important that you don't turn your back on the fact that you are going to have fluctuations there's going to be agitations you're going to vacillate between being on the good foot and the bad foot you know otherwise guess what we wouldn't be here there'd be none of us here now we're all here for a reason we've still got work to do and it's a joyful task you know um so i'm lying in bed thinking of all of that and then bang comes into my head i remembered my wife does qhht you know dolores cannon and she'd done a session for me and I'd had a previous life as an eagle uh, and I had this experience where I was just flying over like Grand Canyon kind of chin up the mentality of just an apex kind of predator eyes forward and I was just like oh my god that's why that spoke to me the way it did because I was connecting with that and it's a beautiful thing about truth and forgiveness is it can collapse linear time you know you look back on something and it makes sense of something in the past it makes sense of something you've projected for the future in the moment and you can forgive the past you can forgive the future you can bring hold hold all of that in the now and and that symbolism that language it makes so much sense to you because you then look back at something and think at the time, I don't know what that meant, you know, at the time that meant what it meant then when I was that age, when I was that far down the path. Now I can look back, apply this understanding now to that, and then that then sort of dissolves and becomes assimilated into the present, cutting ties all the time with perhaps like avenues of thought and concern that would go elsewhere that are not going to hold you in the moment. And then when you are in the moment, and you've removed all of the interference to love's uh, eternal presence, you're going to shine brighter. And, you know, we know, like, jo obviously purposefully joking in the bio about saying to teach is to demonstrate and to say that, you know, all you've got to do is demonstrate you're not an ego. You know, it's very, very simple. And then you're demonstrating it to yourself and you're demonstrating it to other people. And if you think about a mirror, imagine, you know, you're looking in a mirror, you could get a pen and you could draw a halo around yourself in that mirror. Or you could draw a tear on your face in that mirror. That act of um, kind of assigning a quality, either good or bad, hasn't changed the reflected image. It's shown you where you're coming from, if you draw a halo around that image, then obviously you're thinking positively. If you draw a tear, you're thinking sad. Um, but it doesn't change what's in the mirror. And what's in the mirror isn't you either, because it's just a reflection. And that helps with a, a kind of um, metaphor for the world, as we know, that there is no world. It's like the world's an outward picture of an inner condition. And forgiveness is all forgiveness for the self. It's because there's only one of us here and, and we have these blind spots, you know, where thoughts and experiences disappear into our memories and they, 
they fall down so i normally say to people it's like picture yourself on a on a great big lake somewhere in a small rowing boat and you're just sitting there with a bread roll in your hand and you drop it in the water and the reason i've chosen this bread roll is because it's going to soak up water and it's going to go out of your reach and disappear down into the shadows but there is a period of time where it's light enough for you to scoop it out and grab it and they're like your thoughts you know in your memories they're going to go down into the subconscious and then once they've disappeared out of reach where you're going to see them then is appearing in the world quote in other people's behavior and the things that trigger you so then you can use that to say to yourself actually i'm really grateful that i've seen that um that behavior in that person that makes me feel uncomfortable because there is no other person there's only me so therefore what i'm seeing in that person is something that i'm not seeing in myself and then you can look back to see how you've been conditioned in your life it might be you know that somebody didn't give you permission to act that way as a child that then cut trimmed your wings a little bit and made you con conscious where you didn't need to be conscious of something and to just be free so the world has been this mirror it's actually like you know a wonderful system really really helpful because we all have this myopic kind of view subjectivity means that we don't get to see ourselves the way other people see us so if we can clear all of this kind of interference to our sparkle then we can glow brighter and then other people can go dude what's your secret what's going on here even if they don't ask you that you know they they're, they're thinking it somewhere what's your secret and then obviously people will think oh well you've just had you've had the blessed life where you know fairies floated around sprinkling cosmic glitter in front of everywhere you were going to walk and nothing bad's ever happened to you ever and then, you know, when you do tell them about your past and the traumas, but you tell it in a way where you're not defined by it and you look and you're just like, oh, yeah, that stuff happened, you know, all of this stuff goes in, you know, and, it, and, and I kind of like to do this as well without a spiritual slant on it, you know, with a lot of the people I talk to. I'll talk about the principles without telling them it's a course in miracles, without making them feel like they're talking about a spiritual subject. And again, just recently with Cindy, it was like talking about maybe there's no small upsets. That's an incredibly, incredibly powerful thought. And one of the things about the course greatly demonstrated with the workbook is it would be quite rational for our brains to think of like walking into the ocean. I normally say to people, you know, you walk off the land into the ocean and it would be very rational to expect as, as you go into the sea, it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. So you, you apply that logic to the course. Well, I'm only on lesson number one. So obviously, by the time I get to lesson 365, it's going to be so much deeper than lesson number one. And we know that's just simply not the case. You know, that very first lesson is so incredibly powerful. Those first 20, the first 50, you know, all of it is, is incredibly powerful. It's, we know it's holographic. Like Judy used to say, it's a living document. So you come back to it and you see it again, like I was talking about the memories of where you are. It's a mirror, you know, of like where you are. And again, I'll often use like music to explain that to people. I'll say, you know, Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd is a classic album. There's a reason it sold 250 million copies. It was in the charts for like a decade. And as a musician, I've listened to that record for over 35 years and you know it had a massive impression on me say at 15 years old then at 20 25 but now I could put it on today and because my understandings expanded as a musician I could go oh my god he's using like uh, a minor third in that bit there and listen to what the keyboard's doing and Nobody snuck in last night and got my copy of Dark Side of the Moon and, and took it away and brought back another copy with these elements in. They've been there all along. It's me that's changed. My understanding has changed. And that's the same thing with the course. So when I'm talking to these people, I'll say to them, oh, there's no small upsets. And you watch someone go, 
oh my god you know because that that's what happened to me when i had those things presented to me the thing of no degrees in the course you know incredibly powerful concepts that aren't necessarily steeped in a spiritual language you can present them to people without them knowing that they are listening and taking on board something <laughs> incredibly deep and incredibly spiritual and they're very liberating um and what we're trying to do with our course study all the time is reductionism in my you know opinion it's like we're taking 365 lessons and we're trying to whittle it down to one and then we're going to forget about that lesson we're taking 31 chapters down to one then we forget about that chapter because we don't want to be looking at the book we want to be living the book we want to be feeling this this understanding we want to feel it and if we feel it we come from that place and the you know the absence of something can often be demonstrated through the presence of something else so if you've experienced fear and if you've experienced discomfort to like a huge level for decades then when that peace comes it's it's so wonderful and, and in the in the revelatory moments that i've had that are obviously very similar to what a lot of us have had is like it's tears of joy you know because there's a sense in you of like oh my god how did i forget this a peek behind the veil and just a tiny little flash of like dude this is what's really going on and you're just so relieved that you were wrong and you're so relieved that that's the truth of the situation and yeah I think that's been the mission really of like trying to heal myself to shine brightly to then infuse that in the music to now to now enjoy like the course community to go hello, my name's Leon and I believe in God. <laughs> you know, I love the Course in Miracles and people, oh, wow, so do we. And it's like, oh, God, where have you guys been? You know, and Dakini, our lovely friend Dakini, she she sent me an invite to your group. And, and I was like, I'd had a few groups apart from Keith, um, who's a really good friend of mine and Lou. You know, I was a little bit like, because, oh, because, when I came from this solitary experience into the course community on large, the first group I joined was just dog shit, to be honest. It was just like, what the fuck are you guys up to? You know, have you not read this book? You know, they're just warring parties of like, I know more than you. I was just, ah, oh, and, and it was so weird. I just, they hated Ken and I was just like, or, you know, a large, it was the, the war between duality and I'm just like, maybe I'm just supposed to do this on my own, you know, it's like, I need to go. So I left them with a parting post. I never posted in there. It was like, this is my post before I leave. And I just put, what is all in Kenpersing can have no whopness it. <laughs> and just left that post there. And, you know, that was demonstration in itself because some people put angry faces, some people put laughing, some loved it, some put tears. And I'm just like, well, they, what more do you need? It's just, it's just a, you know, it's a joke. I'm not saying anything horrible about him. I love the guy. But, you know, you've all projected whatever you think onto that. So I'm out of there. I'm gone back to being on my own. Then I found Keith through the Miracle Voices and I was like, wow, this is incredible. And then Dakini sent me the message. And then obviously Lloyd does not like joking around, as you know, Steph. He's just incredibly serious. His posts are really boring and dull. He's getting so I'm better. Wrong. He's, getting better <laughs> He's like a fine wine, is he fermenting? <laughs> so, um, yeah, and um, I was sort of like, of course, in miracle support. Mm, okay, right, let's have a look. And then I was like, oh, 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 you know, and just again extended out into this sort of uh, group of people who's just like, wow, isn't this lovely? There's another bunch of people connected. And uh, yeah, just finding the path with everyone, really, and just enjoying sharing, keeping the humor as like a main priority, but also doing the learning, maybe like keeping that separate in a way so that people do come to the podcast with a more lighthearted 
sort of sense of knowing that it's not going to be stuffy and serious. If we're still going to get into who was uh, Maureen Muldoon said, um, thanks for going deep and keeping it light was one of her comments. And I was like, well, there you go. That's what we want to hear, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's just been an absolute joy and it's still growing. It's, you know, it's had no resistance. It's being carried by the mighty companions People are finding it really helpful. I'm finding it really helpful. I'm bringing people like Lou into the community and saying, look, guys, you know, you all need to know about this fella. You know, some of the guests have been people like that who I felt are a little bit more peripheral. It's like, look, I've been really enjoying this person. I want to share. So it's just that it's a lovely thing of wanting to share, isn't it? Whatever it is. Exactly. And that's obviously a massive part of what you guys do with your group. Um, and your meetings and I've watched loads of your meetings as well so it's just finding the joy sharing the joy working out the non-dual um, aspects of things but also like I said experiential authentic experience that that says yep guilt still struggling I was going to use the word guilty but yeah still struggling you know um like we all are so that nobody's pretending to be anything that they're not they're not trying to be holy let's get there together let's work it out together we're all completely equal um yeah very very beautiful thank you so much leon beautiful yeah very very thankful and grateful for you mm. especially you and all your funnies all your memes <laughs> So it's been about an hour. I, I have... just want to just say about the funny memes and stuff. You know, I'm the guy that started that. Oh, just so you know. Respect. <laughs> Hold on a minute. <laughs> yes, that's it. <laughs> I was going to suggest we take like a five minute break and yeah. then we can come back and maybe, uh, Leanne, if anybody has any questions for you or. Oh, yeah, I'd love to talk to anyone. What's that? Yeah, I'd be more than happy to talk to any of the guys. Okay, so basically that's what we'll do. We'll just take five minutes. We usually do this at this point in case anyone wants to get a coffee or whatever. Sure. And then we'll come back and we'll have our usual, we usually have like a collaborative discussion or ask some questions or whatever comes up. Ooh, All beautiful. right, so, yeah. so we shall return in five. All right. So do we pause or do we just leave it open? We're going to pause. Yeah, we're going to pause the recording. Yeah. And we'll just leave, yeah, leave everything open. Beautiful. Amazing. Official. Okay, so <laughs> Lloyd, Lloyd said that, that makes it official. <laughs> now we're official. <laughs> so we're going to invite our, anyone now that has a question or a comment. Um, feel free. I'd like to, I would, I'd like to uh, uh, lay on. Hey, Leon. Hello. How are you, Steve? All right, All right mate. I'm doing great. You, you sound like you're from somewhere close to me. You're from the London area or the home counties? Uh, I was born in Chester. Oh, um, okay. And then I moved down south um, when my mum took us away from all of the chaos. Um, we moved to the the south coast, so it was as far away we could get from what we'd been going through without needing a boat. So, we... oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I know the south. Yeah, I knew you had a southern accent. Anyway, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, what you were saying about dark side of the moon? <laughs> Listen to it years later. I'm not, but funny, I've been listening to the Rolling Stones. You know, and I ain't listened there for some time. I listen to honky tonk women again the other day, and I didn't realise that <laughs> how good song. that chorus is. You know, I didn't realise there was actually harmonies on the chorus. Yeah. Where it goes, oh, honky tonk women. That there's another voice going, oh, honk, or not quite, like, oh, honk, down like that. And there's a there's a, a harmony which I didn't even I never heard it before. <laughs> that song's over fifty years old. How do you go fifty years without hearing a harmony? But I've played in bands all my life as well, so I feel like I should have done, but I didn't. So I know exactly what you're saying there. And you hear these like sympathy for the devil, listening to that. That song is so really deep. Mm. You know, it's not about wanting sympathy for the devil at all. It's about something much deeper than that. Mm. It's uh, really clever, clever stuff that I never sort of even considered before. Because I listened to it when I was a teenager, when I was interested in uh, my, my interest in things wasn't quite as deep as it is now, I suppose. You know, but I totally agree with you there. Like, you know, like you hear things later on in life and you hear them differently because you're in a different phrase of your life and a different understanding of your life, aren't you? 
Yeah. yeah all, great, all great art should have an elasticity that is flexible enough to encompass where you are as a person. And what I'm hearing from what you're saying is not one note in the Rolling Stones song was lost. <laughs> no, it wasn't. We, well, that black harmony was lost on me for 50 years, but I found it in the end. <laughs> I got it in the end. I was stuck at it. What a great song it is, though. Absolutely. What a great, what a great band they were. You know, at the end of the day, I was more into Deep Purple and Black Sabbath and all that than the Stones. Yeah. But like, you know, but but now I realise what they were all about. They really were a great rock and roll band. Mm. And what else I wanted to say? What well, before Ooh, I don't want to sort of take up all the questions. So when you said about God, God isn't God to be spoken of isn't God, mm. right? And that reminded me of um, uh, like the old say like that old sinister thing. God, he who shall not be named, God has no name, he shall not be named. Like he's something sinister or something, <laughs> you know, but it's nothing sinister at all. The reason why he's got no name is because there's nobody else to address him. When you are all that is, who's going to address you? That's so it. You don't need a name. It's as simple as that. And the other bit, God to be spoken of isn't God. Well, there's nothing to speak to because God is no thing. He is. You can't address him. You've got to say, hey, hey, God, because you can't be outside of him to address him. <laughs> so you can't speak to him. I really loved that. That was, that was really good. Good. So there's nowhere where the father ends and the son begins. And no, you know, eternity the act, just is forever, isn't it? Yeah. It's, the, the act of definition becomes redundant because there's nothing to define. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. We've spoke about this a lot, really, in the nature of consciousness, which we talk about on here from time to time. Like, there's not, con yeah, consciousness is the ego. Yeah. God doesn't have a consciousness because there's nothing to be conscious of. He just is. And once you're part of him again, you know you are and you just are. Yeah. You know? But so, I'll tell you what's okay. interesting about that is, you see, this last week or so, I've been thinking, I've like remembered back to like many years ago when you'd be listening to someone who was an atheist, maybe like there's a couple of people in the public eye over here in England who make a big song and dance about being atheists. And I used to feel triggered by it. I used to think, God, why are you so passionate about that God not existing? And I think, well, okay, there's something for me to learn. What am I not happy about here? What can I sort out? And then, you know, that was prior to me having a non-dual understanding and then literally just in the last week, I've been thinking how interesting because almost the same end game comes from being atheist as comes from a non-dual understanding, which is you won't exist anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. <laughs> well, it's, it's reading about like people near death experiences and all that. I've, I've read some section somewhere, I think it's in the book of Seth or something like that. Mm -hmm. When they talk about the illusory afterlife, because there's lots of other life, there's lots of illusory afterlives after this, so where these ND people experiences go, where they meet people. If everything's still separated in any afterlife after this, it's just as illusory as this, because it's an illusion of separation. Mm -hmm. You see, but people don't expect to, like, you know, there's so many people here, I think, uh, I don't know the reason why, but they go back and apparently they meet up with entities who trick them into coming back again and all that which incidentally appears to work in some kind of a computer algorithm or something. Before I learned to, I learned to deal with guilt in my mind back in the day, like I used to be tormented a lot with guilt and like, you know, mm. you're any, you're like you might look at some event or incident and your mind, your ego will automatically find some cringeworthy memory that associates to the event and brings it straight into your mind. Mm. It reminds me like, when you, like we've got a cat called Mercedes, right? And we're talking about the cat, and all of a sudden the computer starts bringing up Mercedes showrooms for me to visit. <laughs> oh, so yeah. somehow it's so it's got an algorithm that picks up that word and finds stuff related to it. Yeah. Just as an apparent celestial org out, the egoic algorithm seems to be doing a similar thing. <laughs> yeah, that's strange. I'm not I'm not saying I'll make any statement about it, but it's strange, and that, and that is a fact. And also this abstract fear that suffering in the morning, where's that coming from? If you're not actually afraid of anything, where is this fear coming from? It must be something outside your understanding. Mm. If it's abstract, do you get what I mean? It's, it's like it's being projected onto you, projected onto you somehow. You know, it's and all also, like... You know, what's interesting is like, do you remember, I don't know if you remember in England, we had the ZX81. It was one of the very first computers in the 80s and it had 1K of memory. 
Yeah, the took ego up a whole room, didn't it? That's right. The ego isn't using a ZX81. The ego is using the same computer. <laughs> it's using a quantum computer, which can you, which can do billions of calculations in a split second. It's not daft because it's it's using that same computer. If you're not living in Australia, it's not going to try and make you scared of scorpions when you're walking down the street in England because it knows there aren't any there. So the language of your ego is based on what it knows to be um, viable fears. Well, if and it makes you fearful, it's keeping you away from home, isn't it? The old, yeah. game, the old game you play here is you're trying to get home by being, realising the love that you come from. And it, mm. all around you is intent on stopping you realising that, keeping you down. Stop it. Don't think that. Think about this. Get scared. Look at the newspapers. It's just full of things to make you scared. It doesn't matter what they're about, but they're all things to make you fearful. And it's all it's all the egoic world trying to make you feel scared. So, you you know, you to lessen your chances of escaping from the game. I'm not saying it is a game, but it can be thought about as a game. Is that There's no real way to get out of here. It isn't anything, really. Any way you can think of it, it helps you get out of it. If you're associated with a game and it helps you get out, well, then use it. But in some, I think it's good to apply to a lot of these kids who play games now because their whole worlds are games. If you can make them understand a comparison to the game and to what truth is, mm. it might actually be a way of teaching them. I oh, God, yeah. Before. Yeah, because we never used to have a, a virtual reality headset, you know, and it's now a great metaphor to explain to someone, you know, you've got a virtual reality headset on. You exactly. Could... We've got a permanent one on. <laughs> We're all looking at it. Yeah. We were discussing something this morning, actually, about you know how the course teaches is that you know none, none, none of the thoughts we think, we think, are our own thoughts, mm. and that's easy to discover if you really want to discover it uh, by simply staying in silence a lot, mm. and especially during the day. Here's I give you a little exercise that really helped me. I used to drive by some, like, I, I liked looking at houses. And I used to, yeah. drive, you know, a certain house, and I'd say, wow, that's a beautiful house, eh? And uh, one day, I just was looking at this house, and I heard, wow, that's a beautiful house, isn't it? And it, I, I got the connection right away. Wow, I didn't say that. <laughs> Something else said it. It was a thought. And what I'm trying to say here is that when you start to really tune in, listen to your thoughts, if you can hear it, you're not the thought. That's right. <laughs> and the more that you practice that, and you will realize <laughs> you've been running your whole freaking life on listening to those thoughts until you don't. <laughs> yeah. Well, they've been running so our life. And then, you know, when you start to disconnect from those thoughts and realize that they're not your thoughts, you can actually hear them and they keep rambling on. Mm -hmm. And it's quite, it, you know, it's it's like at first, it's, you can't even, it, it's it's something you feel inside that was, that goes, well, I've been a, a bloody puppet. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> And, and in different dimensions of, well, I think the mind can activate, is that it can access other dimensions, but yeah. you don't realise it. And these thoughts you're having, the thoughts you're having in some other dimension may be consistent with what's going on there. Mm -hmm. But related to this one, there's nothing, you know, you can't, what's all that about? But if you're actually, your mind expanded into, if it could expand into these other dimensions, that may be what you're thinking about. Sometimes when I fall asleep in front of the TV, I say, wake, and I wake up, and I wake up from a totally different world where I'm in, with a whole history, and I realise, wait a minute, where? Where am I? And it's like, I'll suddenly leave a world that I knew well. It's bizarre, you know. It only seems to happen when I fall asleep in front of the TV as well. You know. well it's like, but it's, it's all illusional. <laughs> that exercise, by the way, every one of you can do that exercise. Just, you know, try it over the next week, let's say. Uh, pick something that's familiar that you that you have a, a um, that you're used to saying sort of automatically. Yeah be anything for me it was like oh i really love that house kind of thing pick something and then you know watch your watch yourself throughout a period of let's say a week and you're going to be surprised okay 
Yeah, don't, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. When you look at something, don't say anything. Just look at it. But you're going to hear what you usually say. <laughs> okay, I'll get you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I understand I, that. Yeah, I'll try that. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. <laughs> so instead of saying I love you, you'll hear I love you. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, we, got some we got some hands up here, guys. So let's just get to that. Tammy, you can go ahead and, and uh, mute yourself. Hey, so, you know, this... I feel like I don't know. First off, okay, hold on. <laughs> this keeps circling in the mind, and I've kind of already worked. Okay, excuse the dual language, but I, you know, like in another group that I was in, you know, it it said be happy, just kind of like this one, you know, smile and be happy. Don't forget to laugh. But there's something in that I'm thinking I'm discovering because it keeps coming up that maybe that like there's a belief that I don't deserve to be happy, <laughs> that I can't be happy, that I don't know how to be happy, <laughs> you know, and it's like, especially like joy too. like, and I'm like, people are like, yeah, joy and this and happiness. And I'm like, I don't know that. So I'm discovering these beliefs because there's no other thing they could be, but a belief, right? And so then I'm trying, then what's happening is like, there's this fine line of, um, you know, you're supposed to allow everything to be like it is. And so I think, cause there's some stuff I'm, there's some shifts happening, shift shifts are happening, not shit, but that's happening too. <laughs> it, it, it's, um, you know, a fine line between allowing what's happening here. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm able to be aware of it but the dream character seems to be experiencing things and I'm doing my, it's a fine line of allowing that dream character to express what is happening, uh, whatever emotions are coming up and watching it. But I'm finding I'm getting really, I could tell it's a belief because I'm getting really irritated when people are saying like, visualize and smile and when you wake up you tell yourself you're gonna have a happy day and i'm like fuck off <laughs> no so i i guess i don't know how do you address that fine line i, I mean I, i'm i'm working with my inner guide on this but since it came up yesterday and then now today and it and it does come up and i i'm trying not to interfere too much but yet acknowledge there's got to be a belief there if this keeps coming up that and obviously if we're here we think we don't deserve happiness or whatnot so if you don't mind touching on that my friend i would appreciate that yeah so, i think the word filtration is really really helpful in this context so and you know in in a sense of like the purification of water as well that all the different filters that say rainwater might have to pass through in order to then become drinking water and also we need to like allow ourselves to see anything that comes up and rub our hands and think oh fantastic because like we're all saying we all know to be true none of us have got everything sussed there's going to be something that crops up and that's basically your next lesson your next bit of growth so I'm like a massive perfectionist I don't like being a novice at stuff and I have to work through phases where I'm uncomfortable not being um, better at something than I want to be so there's been points in my evolution where I've looked at the expanse into which as soon as I identify something, I think, aha, okay. So part of my brain could go, well, you're not very good at that, are you? And then I can flip that over and say, brilliant, I found something that I'm not very good at. This is the next thing for me to grow into. So we're trying to extend, we're trying to expand. So therefore, every time we're presented with a new bit of space that we can grow and expand into. It's actually a gift because it's this filtration of like, you know, like say Keith will say the quote, the bit where it's like the totality of Christ is in every part, an incredibly powerful thing to say, you know, and he, he'll say you can only be the truth or he might say, 
that everything is love, be in love and knowing it's love, or everything is love, be in love and not knowing it's love. So, you know, we, we are just expanding into this understanding of supreme intelligence that we all share. And then you look into the world and you'll see someone, you'll think, if you wanted to come from a judgmental place, you might think that person's not very bright, they're not very clever, or they're consumed with anger, or this, that, and the other. But in fact, the same level of supreme intelligence is in every single part. The totality of Christ is in every single part. So therefore, it's almost like a density of fog. And you can sort of say, we've all we're all in the fog. Sometimes the fog is dissipating and I can see through the fog a bit and it feels like it's uh, clearing and I can see what's on the other side of the fog. Or well, sometimes the fog is, you know, so dense that you can't see the your, your finger in front of your face or whatever. So, you know, when you do have these things that come up, they are gifts because it's like, great, this is the next thing that I can grow into. And the real message, when you think about the Holy Spirit repurposing everything, and equally the ego will repurpose everything. So the real message there is like, oh, no, you know, why aren't, why aren't I in the joy? Instead of clamming up about that, it's like, OK, so why, why am I in the joy? And like you say, why have I got this belief that I can't access this joy? Or I should be having like the David Hofmeister experience of little birds and butterflies, the Disney sort of dream of like, you know, nothing bad ever happens, which is authentic and true to him and his guys. But some people can look at that and think, is that real? You know, I used to see this between two people that I know. Um, one person used to have these thoughts and expressions that were just so lovely and so beautiful. And the other person used to turn around and look at them and sort of go, you can't mean that, you know, because basically he didn't believe that she could be genuine because he couldn't go to that place. He couldn't have those thoughts, but she was having those thoughts and they were genuine and they were this wonderful aspect of like the course mentality of saying, I choose second place so that I can come first, you know, it's like we serve, we get so much joy out of service, but we serve ourselves, we serve each other. And one thing from my own experience has been, you know, to, to see that when people get over their traumas, when we clear whatever that interference is, the fog, however you want to explain it, there's just this dormant waiting altruism. It's just like, how do I serve? How, you know, it's like, then you can recontextualize something. You can say, okay, I had that horrible experience, you know, that, terrified me it was awful and I went through that so that I could come through the other side and I could speak from a place of authenticity sincerity I could have a frequency of truth so that when I do speak to someone they sense that you're being truthful and you're not just giving off some sort of patter and you're having that conversation with yourself I am all of us are and we're just trying to find those parameters to grow into yeah Tammy, thank you so much for just articulating that because, I mean, that's that's all of our experience. This is not a, not a journey of hearts and flowers. You know, once you reach a certain stage, you're going to start triggering the unconscious guilt and the overwhelming, enormous resistance in the unconscious mind. But you know, as you were speaking, I I was reminded of a passage from the course. I can't remember which lesson, but the lesson is joy and peace and love abide in me. <laughs> but then it goes, on to, but then there's a juxtaposition. It goes on to say, but if others could see you the way that you see yourself, they would recoil as if from a poisonous snake. Mm -hmm. Now, isn't that quite the juxtaposition? So what, you know, what Jesus is saying, in a way, it's a little bit humorous, you know, what he's saying there, but what he's saying is, yes, it is the truth that love and joy and peace abide in, in me. But I have an, an enormous belief, you know, and my this is all of us, you know, at some point, we have an enormous belief in sin. We believe we're, we're sinners because we left God. You know, we think we left God and, and we know the rest of the story there. So my point is, this is the journey. It's about looking 
at the terror. You know, it's about looking at the guilt. It's about looking at the irritation and everything that's coming up. I mean, that's, that's what this whole journey is. You're right on track, is my point. But you have to yeah, thank you. Yeah. the nitty gritty, too, of who's looking. Yeah, see, who's, that's the thing. Who's, who's, that's the the, thing. who's happy? Yeah. And, and, and that's, the course is always directed to the mind. And of course, that part of the mind, the split mind and the body, are that's a total connection. There's no gap there. Yeah. And that's interesting because it's like I clearly realize what's happening, but it's trying to tell me still. Because it's like that you're not doing it or you're not forgiving, but it's like I am because when it comes up, I realize what it is. Absolutely. And noticing that there's a belief there and handing it, you know, just being like, oh, look at this. And that, but it's like, it's interesting. It's just that fine line, especially when someone keeps saying, yeah, I'll smile and do this. And, and, and I'm like, but I don't feel like smiling right now. You have but to uh, that's like what Leon was just talking about the authenticity. Yeah. So anyways, thank you guys. Look, it's so you're you're speaking everyone's yeah. journey. I mean, this is what it's all about, right? We do have to remember that the body's neutral. <laughs> oh yeah. It's really important to understand that the body is neutral. It's only receiving from the mind. So it depends on what voice it's listening to, in other words. Like don't take it personal that Tammy's not happy. Oh, I don't, but it's it's just funny the irritation that comes up when other people or teaching and they're saying that that I can see that the ego or and I don't want to you know I'm not trying to separate it because I know it's still part of me but I can tell because it's just like it recoils and it's just like ah the dogs of fear you know they're just like lashing and gashing and it's so, it's funny because I do notice and it's clear like because you guys see me whenever I'm in, a, in that other kind of it's like oh okay here's what's happening but it's just interesting. It's like, yo, yo. We're all like yeah, that. It's all, you know, yeah. it's, a, it's a progressive journey. Right. And, you know, we, <laughs> but we don't stay there as long. It, it keeps getting less and less and less. So yeah. We're Hallelujah. The joy that comes into your life when you really start to take all of this in, it doesn't really matter what you're seeing outside here. It all becomes joyous. Yeah. You no, know, there's a greater purpose behind everything. Everything's happening and, good. And we do know our friend David Hoffmeister actually did not have such a great time at one point, but he is obviously in the joy now. So, oh, yeah. 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 I thought he needs defending. <laughs> but, you know, something else I was just going to say about uh, after losing it. So, apparently, uh, David's a good friend of mine. And I mean, yeah. you know, he's been through some stuff too. He helped me actually go through some of my stuff. Because I, he was the only one at the time, this is a number of years ago, that I could uh, contact. Uh, and I just did it out of the blue. And he got me, re like within two minutes, he got back to me. It was amazing. <laughs> and I was going through some, you know, some terror. And uh, yeah, he, he explained to me, you know, some of the stuff. He did go through a lot of stuff. And that helped. Because, you know, what happens is we think we're the only one. Right. And when we talk to other people going through the same scenarios, yeah. that makes a huge difference because we feel we're not alone. Even though we, you know, we get to a point now we know we're never alone. Mm -hmm. But you know what I'm I'm saying? It just helps mm -hmm. to have a discussion. So mm -hmm. to understand that, you know, you're not the only one going through it. Yeah. And you know what I find for me now, forgiveness is so simple. Like I understand the metaphysics of forgiveness. And now it's just about looking at whatever is coming up. Mm -hmm. It's so simple for me. That's just that's what forgiveness is. It's about having the courage to look at the fear or whatever happens to be coming up. That's what I do. I've dedicated, you know, the rest of my life to doing this. And, you know, we've trained ourselves now, you know, the forgiveness for us now is forgiving our false projections. It has mm -hmm. nothing to do with what's going on out here in the movie. Like it's, it's appearing in the movie, but it all came from the mind. And that's what we're forgiving. We're going back to the mind and forgiving our false projections. We're reversing the projection, in other words. That's what true forgiveness is. Mm -hmm. about, you know, forgiving Steve for telling a bad joke or something. <laughs> like, but interesting <laughs> that we should be speaking about David as well, because David gave me like a, 
a missing piece of my jigsaw with forgiveness. And um, Steph, you've just used the word juxtaposition, which is perfect. And it's like, Dave, I, I was talking to him about, you know, forgiveness sits, waits, it judges not, it merely watches, da 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 da, da. Um, and I was saying, look, you know, it's it's an inactivity, really. And then he he come back and says, kill, great word, killer word. And he just said, yeah, it's passive. And I was like, oh, that is what I've been looking for. Forgiveness is passive. passive yeah. And, you know, judgment, not what is non-judgmental awareness? You know, it's, it's <laughs> not judging something whilst being aware. Judgment's an act. You you invest in judgment. You lean in. You have to refer to the past or the future and the present and rub your hands and think, right, that's right. I've held on to this, you know, and you did this on that day and you said this and whatever it is, you know. And, and if forgiveness is just this passive thing of like allowing all of that bubbling away, not identifying with it, not letting it color and affect you again it's like a triangulation isn't it it's like it's interesting in our system we've obviously got the son the father and the holy spirit and then we've got the decision maker the holy spirit and the ego and these triangulations between these three points in the t in the context of the decision maker and the holy spirit and the ego it's like whatever one of those two colorings is, we are still the one listening, you know? And it, when you say in the course that the atonement principle was set into motion long before Jesus right. completed it, <laughs> it's that thread. The Holy Spirit is the thread that keeps, it's the memory of God that keeps us in our minds so that we don't lose connection with the, the reality of where we're from and, and, and what the truth is really behind all of the, agitations on the top of the water beautiful it's yeah. truly a truly practice and i think i just want to share this little thing that came through a channel i did last week was that mm -hmm. you know with the great awakening now and <clears throat> there is an expansion happening uh we're looking at things that we never even thought we would have the courage to look at and many are going through this now there's things that are being triggered and i know what's happened for me uh, and we're just, it's like the fear of annihilation. Mm. You know, it gets right down to that, right? It gets right down to that primal fear of annihilation. And it's traumatic. And of course, that is what, <laughs> what this is all about. It's the annihilation of the little I. Yeah. So, there's, no, there's no I in God. No right. I in God, no. Yeah. So yeah. fear not if you're going through irritation or whatever because it's all perfectly on time it's on target mm. yeah and uh, there, there are times when you feel you're going to die <laughs> yeah you know you can get to that point and i always tell stephanie that you know we do we have to die before we die <laughs> it's like that's part of the exercise the, the all those old parts of you and not just this lifetime all lifetimes they gotta go <laughs> they really do yeah, yeah. Now, um, Cheryl had her hand up a little yeah. earlier, but Cheryl looks like she left the building. Oh no, <laughs> she's still there. Did you, did you did you want to say something, Cheryl? I'll just say it real quickly. You were talking about music, but I saw a um, interview with John Stewart. You know, and he's getting up there in his age, but now he's working on. He continues making music and performing. And now his portfolio is centered on music from the 30s and 40s. And I've always loved that genre. And um, it, to me, it's all about the harmonies. And I would love to delve further into the, the, the music, the musicality, of course, and spirituality because I think there's such a strong connection there. And also, um, I'm gonna have to go pretty soon. So, but anyway, the, the thing that's on my mind is I've always been very shy <laughs> and it's very hard to, to speak up and talk, but I'm just wondering about you're, you're talking about silence. We get the answers in silence. I've been in silence almost my whole life. 
but there's a lot of chatter going on in the inside. Mm -hmm. And it, it's very difficult to try to quiet that now. Mm -hmm. And I do yoga, so I like what you were talking about, Leon, with using the breath, sharing gratefulness. And I was listen to, listening to Luji, and he talked about using the breath to extend love. Um, there's probably not time for it today, but I, I would be interested in kind of delving more into that aspect too. Well, thank you. Excuse me. Well, thank, thank you. you. Very welcome. good, Leon. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah. I think, you know, it's important to remember that we've got a program running. You know, the ego is like a program running. You can't, you're not going to stop the program running. You're just going to see that it's not you. It's just this chatter. So the silence is there. The silence is behind the program. And the way that we create the distance between our awareness and that silence is just through these initial pauses with forgiveness where, you know, if you think of like in the course where it will say the ego speaks first and the Holy Spirit's voice is only as loud as your willingness to hear it. And then think of someone that you know who's very much in their ego and they will just snap someone's head off straight away, you know, straight away, whatever that reaction is, you know. It's not to say that somebody very peaceful and someone who's working from a bit more of a Holy Spirit centre couldn't have that thought, wouldn't hear that thought, but we've learned to create that pause and that put ourselves in that little bit of space that allows us to then have a secondary option of just like, well, I'm not going to snap, I'm not going to go for that, I'm just going to wait. And then listening to, the, that's like listening to the silence really, because it's the opposite of this reaction. So I appreciate that, um, you know, if you're saying that you've experienced shyness for all that time, so to unmute yourself and to come on and take centre stage, I think it's really lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Chaz with her hand up. Uh, Chaz got her hand up, and I just want to share a little quote, Cheryl, from uh, I think it was John Mark Hammer who said, Love is the willingness to create a spaciousness in which something can change. <laughs> and I always love that, that quote. There you go, mic drop. <laughs> mic drop. Chaz, go ahead and unmute yourself. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Uh, I just wanted to share that when I started this journey, one of the first things that I was shown was the cover of that album and it really wasn't even my generation but i had seen it and spirit showed it to me reversed mm -hmm. and so what's the message was was no matter what i think i see happiness sadness thoughts whatever uh joy suffering that rainbow going into the prism and my inner guide said i want you to see only the white light mm -hmm. So that was my first experience at making it all the same. Beautiful. So I just wanted to share that, you know, an album cover that really helps me to make it all the same. Beautiful. Thank you so much. The interpretation of that symbol. And obviously the symbols like originated from... Um, like Isaac Newton's sort of discoveries, isn't it? Of like the fractal nature of light, that all of the spectrums contained within that one light. So uh, it's got a long history. There's a reason Pink Floyd used it. And uh, it's a very powerful image and it's a very powerful symbol. Um, and spirits obviously recognized that. And in your language, just gone, right, this is the way to get a maximum expression of love out of this. <laughs> <laughs> that will last for a long time for your whole journey I would suggest that you can then share with the rest of us so there's some it's got some legs in it okay Anna go ahead and unmute yourself Anna good evening Hi. yeah I've just been noticing that I that I've been thinking about how come 
I've been so ex extremely hard on myself all my life, uh, but not to other people. I mean, I would see other people in situations like mine, illnesses or some other stuff. And I would never tell them stuff I have like thought about myself, like, okay, you're too ill to heal. It's wrong with your body. It's something wrong with your body, you know, or you made the wrong decision there. You made the wrong. Uh, I mean, I've been so hard on myself and I, I can see like God in other people in other people's eyes, you know, in nature, everything. And I realize I haven't, I must haven't found God in, in me. And I realize now with the course that it's probably a lot because of this deep guilt mm. and fear mm. because not feeling worthy. Mm. So, so I, I now, yeah, I have seen this and I've noticed this and I do the course. I'm a beginner. If you just want to like say something about this. Yeah. I'll tell you, feeling of unworthiness. Yeah. I'll tell you a really, really helpful and simple tool tool that you can put in your toolkit and that is to think about the evolution of like a child and their parent and every pretty much every kid will have a day with their parent where they'll go oh I hate you I wish I'd never been born and then they'll run out of the house and they'll go in the garden somewhere and they'll go and hide for a minute and they're they're, they're pretty much acting out this fantasy that they're not that they're, they're not connected to their parent and it's just a fantasy. It's just an expression, you know. Um, and after a little while, they'll probably come in with their tail between their legs or the parent. If it's a heart led parent, they'll come out and find them and they'll say, honey, you you know, do you want to come and have a biscuit and a drink? There'll be some expression of love to, to make this bridge one way or another. And with this ontological guilt, you know, and we, we can we can really diffuse the the power that it seems to have just by giving it a really simple context and just think, you know, I had this thought where I thought, I want to know what it's like to be separate from God. It's not possible because you can't be outside of God. It's like, um, I think it was Voltaire who said, God is a circle whose circumference is nowhere and whose center is everywhere. So that there's nowhere that God isn't, but we had this tiny little mad idea where we thought we would like to have a, we'd like to dabble in what it would be like to be away from God. So then, like I said, with this context with the child, you say, I, I hate you, mum, I wish I'd never been born. You run outside, you act that out. It doesn't happen. You come back in, you didn't really mean it. And then a, a really good way to take the sting out of that is to then say, well, you know, what have I learned as a consequence of that thought, which is like, I didn't want that. Actually, I didn't want that. And and we've got one dream in mind. You're, it's really important to remember there's nothing exclusive. It's going to present itself in ways that are individual to all of us. Like I said, you know, being open about my thing has been rejection from my dad the shame of feeling rejected and then wanting to conceal something about myself because I picked up on all of that stuff. But he was actually projecting onto me the fact that he didn't know how to love me because he would, he'd re, he'd re, um, reproduced a dynamic from his childhood. So when he was a small boy, he'd been sent away from his siblings and he missed out on the love of the family unit. And then when he was an adult and he got his own family unit with him, my mum and myself, his criminal activities put him in jail. And then he's missed out on being with his family unit again. So he's carried this lesson again into a new format. So because he was uncomfortable with himself about doing that, he he projected that onto me as a child because he was he didn't know how to get over he didn't know how to forgive himself in our language but I was too young to know that that was what was going on all I could tell was that I sensed a rejection from my dad that made me feel ashamed there must be something wrong with me and then there was something for me to conceal 
it's really important to look at these resistances to love in ourselves to know that they're all the same but different you're not having any experience that anyone else isn't having and that's why we come together to talk to each other and have like an open forum where things can be shared in a non-judgmental way so we learn what it feels like to say you've just done something really really brave by saying that out loud and you've said it in a consequence free environment because everybody here is just going to have our hearts going out to you um, and wanting to help you find the love that is yours and that you deserve to find and en route to that location which isn't as he says in the course of miracles heaven isn't a place it's a state of awareness of perfect oneness every time we make these steps towards it the ego goes whoa hold on a minute i feel like you're moving away from me i'm gonna have to ramp up my viciousness you know you're you're getting more and more peaceful i'm gonna have to ramp up my viciousness so we've got that interplay to watch but you know it sometimes it's easier to to, to see things in other people well it is easier to see things in the world because you know that's part of how we learn we we do discover things in other people that are things that are either difficult in us or things that we recognize because we've already learned to extend that and to manifest that yeah yeah thank you so yeah take you can take the sting out of it by simply thinking this is going to show me what I want. Yeah. So I have a phrase where I'll say a no is as good as a yes. And it might be to do with work. And we've got 10 options. And someone will go, no. And I'll go, okay. And then they'll almost say, oh, I'm sorry that I haven't said yes. And I'm like, well, now we've got nine. So that no just means that's out of the way, that's out of the way. That, and we're just whittling it down until we get to the yes. So we can be grateful for all of those no's because they're removing the interference so you know the light the sun still shines behind the clouds is another way that i like to say it you know and just because we can't see it doesn't mean the light has gone out thank you welcome thank you well it's 155 but mm. a good time to maybe call it a call it a wrap that's, did you have a question? I thought I saw you with your hand up. No? No? Okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe I have a short, uh, a short uh, uh, thing I want to bring in. Very short. Because for me, still the most challenging part is um, talk to my brothers because I still feel have... The, the need to um, talk with them about the course because the course is the only thing that really interests me. <laughs> um, so, um, and I still want to fix. So then I use the course to fix. So what I'm basically saying is that um, um I'm kind of in a, a, an area where I know the, the metaphysics of the course and I know the, the stepping back and I feel the, 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 what I am and, and now what? <laughs> mm -hmm. And now what? <laughs> yeah, something like that. I do, need, I do know, I, you don't have to give me an answer, but you know, yeah. because uh, Stephanie said, do you want to say something? <laughs> that is what, now what? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a really nice phase in our journey, you know, it's like um, where we're so excited about this thing that's brought us additional joy and peace and we just want to share it with other people. Yeah. Then, you know, that, that, that helps us to get towards this point where it says your mission's simple. You just live as to demonstrate you're not an ego. And I've noticed that in myself where, you know, I just wanted to say, oh, oh, of course it miracles, of course it miracles. And then I've learned to just like stop saying that. And I didn't give myself a hard time about it because it's like, it's no different to me going to a restaurant and going, Tess, you've got to go and try this restaurant, you know, and you go, well, I don't like Indian food, you know, I'm like, okay, you know, 
but but the principles there it's just a kindness it's just wanting to extend that kindness and you know you're in a fortunate position where you've got an awareness of the metaphysics where of course in miracles is one of the paths that leads us home that you're walking on and as i've discovered in the last few years there's plenty of people to enjoy it with isn't there yeah 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 and you do some beautiful sharing you do lovely honest sharing and there's so much power in you know if you think of like um, my invulnerability lies in my defenselessness you know it's that exact same principle it's that thing that I do with music when I just sit there and I play a song and, and express words that your ego would probably not want you to say because it's just laying your heart bare but then the other people know what a bare heart feels like which is everyone it's whether or not you're just cloaking that behind a bravado or um, a shield to protect yourself they still know what that feels like we all see that we all identify with that and, and that light is what illuminates the path ahead for other people so you're casting a lot of light perfect yeah I was just, just to add to that it's 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 the demonstration you can step back and just be the demonstration and it's, yeah it's amazing but Tess it's really amazing how that attracts like we we have a summer home down in a in a place called Prince Edward County uh it's in a like a uh trailer park situation we have a motorhome down there and we don't get involved in any of the politics you know going on in the park or the big parties going on we're, we're sort of off to ourselves, and it's amazing how the people respect us and when, when somebody's got a problem we're the first people they come to yeah. <laughs> that's because we stay out of their problems right right mm -hmm. uh and they we've heard people say and we, we've overheard conversations saying these people are really different <laughs> <laughs> no we're different oh, yeah. it's one th one of the ladies and we've become really good friends you know with yeah. like probably seven or eight different people yeah. but they say one person said you guys are neutral neutral and that's why we love you yeah now we don't do anything you know to try to make that impression of ourselves we're just being ourselves mm -hmm. but it's just interesting mm -hmm. We yeah. just don't get you don't get involved anymore in the world in a sense. <laughs> yeah, but I read the newspapers every day and you only use my course to wedge the door open while I carry them in. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Angela, we have one more one more hand up. Angela, go ahead and unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me again, Stephanie Boyd. And Leon, yeah, I really appreciate your talk today, and everyone here. You do. I don't have a whole lot to say other than you know I kept looking across my books, and this is a book wanting to read, and it's called "Why Is God Laughing," <laughs> and uh, of course it's written by Deepak Chopra. Oh yeah, never days. heard of her. I've oh. met him. A couple of times and <laughs> bought a couple of his books and found them very helpful. Good. But I just want to read this one part because we spoke about when you mm -hmm. forgot to laugh. It's just so funny because this was sort of one of my books I was hoping to read soon. It says, laughing shows us without a doubt that there is always a reason to be grateful that every possibility holds the promise of abundance and that obstacles are simply opportunities in disguise. In the end, we really don't need a reason to be happy. The power of happiness lies within each of us, just waiting to be unleashed. Wow. Well, so I think this was a fictional one that he wrote, and I'm looking forward to most of them I don't they're not fictional from the park, but uh, anyways. Um, and so I, I do believe, as we say in the course, joy is our, I never get the quote, joy is in our inheritance. Yep. 
Well, you know, I, I remember realizing one day that when we're laughing, we're actually collapsing timelines. <laughs> Amazing. Another one I love in the course that, you know, I never got for a long time was if we're thinking about the past or future, our mind is blank. Hmm. That's a really good one. <laughs> yeah. I well, want to ask you one more thing, Leon. You like Peter Gabriel? <clears throat> yeah. 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 I really like his stuff. Yeah, my favorite bands would be like The Who, Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, Black Sabbath, Frank Zappa. All the, I like Free, Leonard Skinner. Then oh, I yeah. go into like ACDC. And then I like stuff like Crosby, Stills and Nash, Neil Young, John Martin, Nick Drake. I've got quite a lot of jazz records in my collection. But, um... And Warm Rain. <laughs> Never heard of them. <laughs> they have a fantastic, fantastic vocalist. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, Warm Rain. So that name came to me as like... Um, I had a song called Warm Rain and my best friend was sitting across the table from me and we didn't have a name for the band and he could see my song list from the other side of the table and he went, that's the name of the band, Warm Rain. And I was like, oh, oh. And, you, you know, um, I think Tess and I have spoken about this recently. You know, the reason with Warm Rain is like, <clears throat> it's like nature's baptism. So you're standing in the light getting the rain it's just like that perfect um com complementary contrast of the two aspects of nature and um it fitted perfectly with what the music did for me it was like catharsis it was a way of playing out and processing all of these experiences so that i could see myself come through it all and so that i could put it into a form where other people could feel connection because I think one of the things that, I don't know if bothered me is the right way to say it, but I'll just say it bothered me, is like the fact that we have this thing called loneliness when there's 8 billion people. It's like, why do we have loneliness? It's like, we don't need to have loneliness, you know? So we need connection. And if we connect with each other by making ourselves feel vulnerable and expressing that, that's almost like lighting up the dark, corner of the room and, and that's no different to the mind it's like you know you get the flashlight you point it in every little spot in your mind because if you don't then you're going to imagine that there's monsters in that corner and there really isn't and when you get the light and fly, flashlight point it in there you illuminate it you go ah oh, there's nothing there you know and that's a great metaphor for the whole thing and that's music has helped me with that once that I came of that age and it still continues to do that and I think I didn't really keep much tabs on it, but I know, like, say, like a quarter of a million people have downloaded Warm Rain's music. Uh, and when I get a digital statement, I'm literally scrolling through it like that on my phone. And the list of countries, it's bonkers. It's like 70, 80 different countries a month. I just think, yes, I've got no idea. I'll be doing something around the house or I'm going to work and that is just doing its thing just spreading out and helping all those people to not feel alone and that's just incredible yeah Leon, i'm sorry so on youtube where you do some music i'm not quite familiar i beg your pardon what was that do you have youtube where you are singing some of your uh, music yeah yeah so um that would just be called warm rain official and there's a channel or you know anybody who uses all the digital i don't know if you guys are into that but you can find it everywhere it's just called warm rain there's a really beautiful website with lots of information about the record tells you more about the story um on my podcast channel um may the course be with you there is some playlists and if you open up the playlist you'll find interviews about the music um and on the Warm Rain official YouTube channel, my wife made about, she made a, a handful of really, really fantastic videos for some of the songs. So it's not just listening. And we're most known for our cover version of Eurythmics, Here Comes the Rain Again. Um, and that's a really good video. That's really interesting. So, yeah, there's plenty out there.
Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, guys, we're going to stop the recording now. So mm. well, we'll probably just go ahead and stop the meeting. I think it's time. Yep, pretty yeah, much. perfect. Hey, thank you, Leon, for I mean, thank you. Awesome, beautiful and gentle Fantastic. and with lots of insights, wisdom, mm. laughs kicking around here and there. Um, and I'm just and beautiful for participants. Participants, absolutely. <laughs> That's what it's all about. So let's just take ourselves off mute. I just want to thank you, Leon, for your participation here today. And we'll send you some about that love back now that you've just extended out. Mm. Thank you, Leon. Okay. Thank you, Leon. Thanks, Leon. Thank you. Cheers, mate. That was so I really enjoyed that. It was a good crack. Beautiful. Good on you. Thank you.